So it's no surprise that experiential marketing is on the, to on the lips of everyone here and is a hot topic. Um, and without defining it, it really runs the gamut. I mean, there's event marketing, as we all kind of uh, associate experiential marketing with. There's guerrilla marketing, retail tainment, sponsorship, package design, uh, digital marketing, word of mouth marketing, merchandising, direct marketing, sponsorships. All these tend to fall under what people are beginning the term experiential. But really what these are is just experience-based marketing tactics. Now, without jumping into a definition, I like to put out this particular quote, which I think is uh, solliptic enough to, to, to put it out there, where experiential marketing is the antonym of product-centric marketing, which makes customer-centric marketing somewhat synonymous with experiential marketing. It's a nice little loop. But really, that's what it is. It is, it is marketing with the consumer in mind and with the consumer's desires and wants in your heart as well. Now, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be one of the founding board members of the International Experiential Marketing Association. Um, and actually, parenthetically, Lee Parkinson is as well. And together with Lee and, and three or four other colleagues at the IXMA, uh, we put out an email that, uh, to our members asking them to define experiential marketing. And as our panels here today, especially in this morning, uh, found out, um, there really is no definition. We got over 300 back. So instead of defining what experiential marketing is, we decided to put out a manifesto, so to speak, of what it should strive to be. Uh, and it's not just for experiential marketing, come to think of it, that what it should strive to be. Uh, it's really for all marketing in the future, going, going forward in this attention economy, in this new consumer marketplace. And I'm here to share with you the, the, the eight-point manifesto that we came up with, which ultimately became the germ of, of, of the book. Uh, and I'll go through them really quickly now, and then I will show you some case examples of what I mean by, by these manifesto points. So the first one, experiential marketing campaigns should clearly deliver a meaningful benefit to the consumer. It will be predicated on one-on-one -on -one personal interaction between a marketer and a consumer. It must be authentic. Experiential marketing is based on engaging people in memorable ways. It will empower the individual consumer and unleash the power of grassroots evangelism. It will deliver relevant communications to consumers only where and when they are most responsive to them. It's a big one. Experiential marketing's goal is to succeed using innovation to reach consumers in creative and compelling ways. And finally, experiential marketing will make or break the brands of the future. So this was the manifesto that we put out there. And, and going through them, it was, it was obvious that to explain it, I really needed to put some case studies or some examples to it. <clears throat> so let's go through them one by one. Experiential marketing should deliver a meaningful benefit to the consumer. When I was in Toronto a few years back, I was blown away in the grocery store when I saw this campaign from Kellogg's. Um, instead of the usual trinket that you get in a cereal box, whether it's a lick-on tattoo or a little decoder ring or whatever, Kellogg's decided to put in 800,000 pedometers into their, into their packages. And the reason was it was part of a program to get kids more active. Um, and moms would buy the cereal and they would give the pedometer to their, to their kids. And every day they would log how many steps they took. And that log would go onto a website and they can track how physically active the kids are. Now, a decoder ring or a lick-on tattoo, whatever the little prizes you would get, costs a penny, if not less. But each decoder, uh, I'm sorry, each pedometer costs about $15 at retail. And they put in 800,000 of them. So I was blown away. I was a new father at the time. I was like, wow, Kellogg really wants me to, to get my kids to be more active. And by doing something as simple as putting a pedometer into a box of cereal really made it experiential. So it used to be a, a toy or whatnot, and now it's about health. And that really resonated with me, and it was a complete success in Canada at the time. So how can experiential marketing be delivered? And it takes us to our second point. It will be predicated on a one-on-one -on -one personal interaction between a marketer and a consumer. I believe, it's my own personal opinion, that the best way to, to deliver a marketing message is through a dialogue, one-on-one, -on -one, through people, hopefully in a language that both people understand. Um, and building this dialogue is one of the most important things about experiential marketing. You know, traditional advertising is all about a monologue. And, and a lot of people, we, we talk about marketing to 18 to 24 year olds or marketing to the nexus generation. Never talk about marketing with. And here's a simple campaign where they wanted to sample carry hand lotion. Instead of just handing them out at the, at the train stops or, or whatnot in, in high traffic locations, this company decided to do hand massages. And so for five minutes, you're not only experiencing the, the, the actual lotion, but the brand ambassador is asking questions. What lotion do you use? What do you like about this? What don't you like about this? And the personal communication and the dialogue that happens during this interaction 
drives insights into not only future campaigns and future product development, but can also drive the messaging that you're going to do the next day. So your script from the brand ambassadors can actually change from day to day based upon the interactions that you're having with people feet on the street. In this particular case, there's uh, facial massages to guys. Guys wouldn't know what an exfoliant is if it hit them in the head. But you sit them down with a nice, good-looking woman and give them a, a five to ten minute facial massage, allows them to understand the product, gives them a little bit of a benefit, and gets them to talk about it when they go back to their friends. And I love this picture to the left because the guy was riding his bike and he stopped to sit in the, in, in the chair. And how often, how hard is it to get a 19-year-old guy to stop and listen to a marketing message? So I think this, this dialogue by a personal interaction, it could be a call service center for all, for all that matters, allows us to engage in a two-way conversation. And this allows us to find insights. And insights is the key to our business. It's the key to where we are here. The big idea comes from interactions like this. So why is an interaction like this so important? Well, it's because we're social creatures, first of all, obviously. But it just so happens that some people are more influential than others. They're so-called influentials, or Gladwell would call them mavens or whatnot. But these people don't really like to participate or engage or react to traditional marketing campaigns. A recent survey in Marketing Magazine a year ago said that 53% of so-called influentials actively avoid buy buying products that over-advertise. So here you are, you got a great ad campaign, but the people that you want to reach, the ones that are going to spread your message within their networks, don't like it and don't want to listen to it. 74% of them actively avoid buying products. And uh, I'm sorry, 74% of them feel that there's too many commercial messages out there to even respond to. So by connecting with influentials on a one-on-one -on -one level allows you to have them do the marketing for you. And one of the best examples I can think of in the United States is the Apple Genius Bar. The Apple Genius Bar in, in the Apple stores is a place where influentials can come in, bring their computer, give any type of uh, problem-solving uh, uh, experience with an Apple Genius person, and go back and tell their friends about it. Now, Apple stores, about 100,000, uh, 10,000 people come in every week. Uh, it's the fastest growing retail operation in the United States right now. It kicks the pants out of Gap. It generates about $1 billion in sales each quarter. And interestingly, Apple only serves about 3% of the, of the computing public. Now, when you go into a Genius Bar and you bring your computer, what's very really interesting is Apple, a post-warranty tech support is $49. Dell and HP is around $40, $45 as well. But all the support in Apple Genius Bar is absolutely free. And this is key. Apple stores are now becoming a social space, much like Starbucks, for people to come in, hang out, learn about products, and take that information back to their friends. As a matter of fact, two years ago, Time Out New York voted the Soho uh, Apple Store as the number one pickup place in all of New York City.